and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Puritan Barn and the Midnight Ride. It is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you to tonight's broadcast. And tonight we're going to be examining the oldest pagan worship site on earth. Our broadcast is entitled The Giants of Baalbek, and it's going to be a very, very compelling ride i guarantee you so get ready it all starts right now because we are now live 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 what's up guys once again we're here like david said in the puritan barn ready to just do the best that we can to give you guys information that is very valid very important and at the same time super interesting and you know for those of us that are interested in our ancient history and our ancient past and being able to decode these things is just an amazing thing that I'm thankful and grateful for. So wherever you guys are listening from, if you're listening live or if you're listening after this video is done, let us know where you guys are. Uh, we we love you guys. We hope that you guys enjoy the show. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors. And I want to start out with Sugar and Spice Soap Company. Their uh, website's in the description, but they offer um, all natural soaps, you know, soaps that for people like me that don't mess with pork products or don't like chemicals that are on their skin, you know, soaking into their body, this is a great alternative and, and beautiful soaps, amazing stuff. They even have beard oils and all of those different things. And all of you guys can get 10% off anything for uh, with in the code NYSTV. And they have a midnight ride soap just for you guys. So make sure you check that out. Also, FOJC Radio. This is David and Donna's ministry. They've been doing this for 40 years, and they have their content all in one website, so you can go check that out and see a, so many shows. I mean, you could never stop. You probably could start watching now and spend 10 years watching all the stuff they have going on over there. Um, also, I want to uh, nystv.org. That's our website, and this and this website, we have exclusive content that we don't have on YouTube, that we don't have anywhere else because – mainly because uh, we need a place to be able to protect our content. You know, we have the Book of Enoch video commentary. Uh, we have shows that have been banned from YouTube, shows that are too hot for YouTube. We have exclusive documentaries and more that we're working on. Uh, and if you use the code RIDER, that gets you $8.99 off for your first month. So make sure you check it out. Also, Watts Leather. Um, beautiful custom leather pieces for anything from book covers to make your library look like an old ancient uh, library that's straight out of one of these ancient cities, right? Uh, you can make gun holster. You can have them make gun holsters, all custom uh, journals. I got this amazing journal that I'm going to pass on to my children one day, but it has our family crest on the thing and we can write, I've been writing things in it for them. Really, really cool stuff that lasts uh, just amazing. Watts leather, all of those links that I described to you guys are in the description. Um, with that being said, David, how are you doing? Doing just fantastic. It has just been a great week. A lot of good things are going on, and um, we're just so thankful for everything the Lord's done. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that, man. I was just thinking today about, you know, little things that, you know, I might get irritated with. You know, somebody else may may literally be praying for all of the things that I take for granted. You know, all of the things, yes. like having every light on the house on today, I was like yes. kind of upset about it, and I thought, you know, how lonely would I feel if I didn't have anybody to turn every light in the house on that I that's have? That's exactly right. Or, yeah. or if I didn't have lights to turn on, right? So That's exactly right. But it's being grateful and thankful is so important. But with that being said, David, I think people are ready to hear about these crazy giants um, and the history behind all this and where this came from and, and all of that. So I'm excited anyway. I know that. All right. Well, we'll get going. I might make mention before we begin 
we will have another FOJC Sunday Night Live on our Rumble. They've been doing very well. We're thankful. So that will be there for you uh, if you would care to watch. Um, we're going to be looking at Balback, and I know many of you are familiar with Balback, and we're going to be giving out some of the amazing history of it. And then we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about Balback. And I know people will say, well, Balback isn't in the Bible, and the word Balback is not. But when we study this site, we will be finding out other names that Balback has been known by, and they are in the Bible. So we can use scripture to trace the history of this site. And this goes all the way back to Cain or even older, in my opinion. This is the, uh, I will call this the oldest pagan worship site on earth. So we're going to begin by giving you some basic information about Baalbek. We have a little video here and we'll be showing you some other slides to just uh, show just what we're talking about here. So we're here at Baalbek. This is the famous quarry, which is just about less than a kilometer from the main Baalbek site. Behind me is the Stone of the South, or the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, it's also called. And just beneath that, over that side, is the 1,650 ton stone that was found and rediscovered and dug out in 2014. So this is really rewriting the history of the planet here because people like Graham Hancock and other researchers suggest these are pre-Roman, these are ancient sites, there's even legends that state this was built by uh, Cain who was uh, you know, linked with the patriarchs of the Bible going back many, many thousands of years and it was peopled and built by giants connected with Cain. There's also stories about Kronos and the Titans being involved in this and there's other stories of giants like the Nephilim being involved. There's so much going on here with the prehistory with the local folklore and traditions that have been recorded for the last couple of hundred years. And, you know, if the Romans did build this site, did build Baalbek completely, including the platform, why didn't they reuse this? Was this completely buried in sand and dirt? Why wasn't it reused? It's just, it's just too incredible. This is, oh, this is roughly a thousand tons, more or less exactly, just a fraction over a thousand tons, this one. We're going to go and look at the other quarry which has got uh, an unnamed stone, which is about 1,240 tons, but it's the 1,650 ton one. That's the really interesting one, combined with the whole mythology and stories, which we'll get more into when we go to the other quarries and we go to the Baalbek temple itself. So we're just looking at the Stone of the South, also called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. You can also see a mound kind of up behind. Wow. You know, what can you say but wow. I mean, this today, that you know, and so, the, the story from history is the Romans handled those stones. But Graham Hancock, who we're going to have some quotes from here in just a moment, I mean, with the Romans could not have done this this was beyond their capability today with all the modern equipment 1650 tons stone we could not do anything with it i don't think there's any way that you can rationalize that this is anything but something that had to have some supernatural or giant assistance to it there's just no other way to explain this in my opinion yeah i mean the heaviest thing that we have um, 
you know, capabilities of moving, I'm pretty sure is, you know, nowhere near, near that. But then again, I don't, I don't really know for sure. I know that, um, they remove, they did like I'm reading right here. So it says in October, 2011, a portion of the North Rankin B platform, uh, which weighed 23,000 tons was listed to a loft or lifted to a lofty height of 86.9 feet at a shipyard. Um, I'm not how sure, I'm not sure how legitimate this, this, uh, you know, this, uh, odd, I guess, uh, article is here though, uh, because it, to me, it looks like there's other ones that say much, much less. This one is actually got things spelled wrong in it. So I think it's probably not, not even true, but that's amazing to me. I mean, I can't, I know that, you know, ton, the cranes have a problem lifting several thousand pounds, you know, several hundred tons, you know? Yeah. So let alone move these, the distances they did and use them in construction. Yeah. I mean, it's just mind boggling. And um, I would tend to believe that this is the work of the Nephilim, and this is the local uh, legends and the stories about Baalbek. The people there around there for years and centuries have believed that these were the work of the ancient giants. And when you look at the size of the stones here, that would be the logical conclusion you'd come to if you didn't know anything about anything. But, so the heaviest list of all time, I went ahead and looked this up for you, David, because I think it's cool. The heaviest of all time, and this is according to uh, an actual legitimate site here, was 20,000 metric tons. That's the heaviest lift of all time. Okay. So nowhere close. And that's just we're talking about a vertical lift. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's with a huge, huge crane. Not even nothing like what they had back then, I would imagine. So. Yeah. But. We have some more uh, slides here to show you about Baalbek, and uh, this has been for thousands of years a pagan worship site. There have been various different pagan temples built here. This is the ruin of the Temple of the Muses that was there, one of the temple. And the Muses, these were the feminine devils that were the inspiration of music and art and things like that. That's where we get our word music. In this other temple here, in this next slide, we see the temple of Bacchus. And Bacchus was worshipped in Roman times, and it was worshipped with all kinds of orgiastic and uh, uh, licentious behavior. And uh, another temple here is the temple of Venus. And Venus, we know from Isaiah 14, that Lucifer was worshipped as the planet Venus. And we're going to see here that the worship of the uh, host of heaven has been a part of this all the way back, as far as paganism goes. We're going to see that Jupiter was worshipped here. We're going to see also that Venus was. And here in the, this last slide, there is the temple of Jupiter. And this is a the most amazing to me this is one of the most amazing places on earth if i would have a bucket list this would be one of the places yeah. that i would like to see because it's just absolutely phenomenal but the paganism that has been put forth here we're looking really at ground zero of the satanic uh, uh arsenal and where we're located here we are 35 miles from damascus and if you go to the on, on the northern boundary of Israel, we have Mount Hermon, and this is where the, the, the book of Enoch says in chapter 6 that the 200 watchers came down. And right at the base of Mount Hermon, going off to the, uh, it would be the, the southwest corner, there is a valley that goes down right into Baalbek. And we're going to be giving you the history of this area and how important it is. This area has been supremely important, and it is the, the place where Satan has launched his attack on the people of God for a long, long time, and it continues to this day. Now, Graham Hancock in this book, The Magician of the Gods, and as was mentioned in the video we played, Mr. Hancock has argued that because of the nature of just the huge size of these stones, the way that we, they were moved and used in construction, that they have to be pre-Roman. 
and I think that's just an obvious conclusion. But Mr. Hancock makes other connections here, and he says this is on page 255 of his book. He says, Freemasons who have studied the Temple of Bacchus point to a number of reliefs and designs here that are meaningful to them. For example, on the underside of a huge ceiling block still balanced on the columns of the temple appears the device known as the Seal of Solomon, a six-pointed star inscribed within a circle. According to leading U.S. Freemason, Timothy Hogan, Grand Master of the Knights Templar Order, the figure in the center of the star is depicted giving a sign that would be familiar to entered apprentices. And this is showing that Freemasonry is the propagator of the most ancient forms of paganism. They have taken these Luciferian rites and this star of the six-pointed star, we've talked about this a lot. In Scripture, it's called the Star of Rimfan. And people today, they want to call this the Star of David, and they want to turn it into something godly. But it is not. This is the Star of Rimfan, and we can find this in the most ancient of pagan temples. And as we go forward, we're going to see the association of this area with Solomon, with the seal of Solomon, with the darkest black magic, and of the absolute ruin. Well, not the absolute ruin. Israel is not ruined. The Israel of God is alive and well. But we're going to show the role that this area played in the, the apostasy of the nation of Israel. And we know there's a lot of times, John, when we have tried to point this out, that that seal of Solomon, it's not a godly thing. People want to get all been out of shape about it but it's a fact it's just an absolute fact it really is and it's, it's so it's so hard to convince people that because they've been so accustomed to seeing that and they're like oh how can a whole nation be wrong about this not being that but do, do you will never find a place in the bible that mentions the star of david uh, like you said yeah. you'll you'll find the star of moloch star of rimfan you'll find that but definitely not the star of david and i think we proved it in one episode that exactly what that star of rimfan and the star of uh, Moloch are, you know, it's the five and six pointed stars. Yeah. So. And that was the opinion of the father that yeah. the whole nation went wrong and he judged them. Yeah. And uh, it would be good for us all to pay attention. Now, Baalbek plays huge in the uh, narrative of the ancient alien. And Zechariah Sitchkin was one of the biggest voices in the ancient uh, alien narrative. And according to those, Baalbek was built by people from other planets that came down here, the ancient alien narrative that people on Earth were created by aliens and uh, they're going to come back and, you know, the Space Brothers are going to save us and that whole narrative. And we could certainly have some false narratives of that play out. We better uh, hold on and uh, take notice. We talked about a few of those scenarios in the Melchizedek Midnight Ride. But this is what Mr. Sitchkin said in his book, The Stairway to Heaven. He says the spaceport and the landing place at Baalbek lay on the perimeter of an inner circle, forming a vital team of installations that were equidistant from the control center in Jerusalem. So according to Mr. Sitchkin, we've got a bunch of spaceports here for the Anunnaki landing ships. And if you just do away with the uh, spaceman genre and just replace the fallen angels and the giants, we have a pretty good picture of what is going on here. Now, when we begin to unpack what the Bible has to say about Baalbek, we, we can begin to do that when we understand the other names that Baalbek has been known down through history and this has been here way back you know i think it goes all the way back to the fall of man now this is the mcclintock and strong it's the cyclopedia of biblical theological and ecclesiastical literature and that is the same james strong of strong's concordance fame and i'm going to use this as a, a source to unpack the ancient names of Baalbek, and we're going to go to Scripture, and we're going to see the history of it, and not only the history of Baalbek, but the spiritual impact it had upon Israel, 
and the spiritual impact it has to this day upon the world. Now, in uh, this cyclopedia by McClintock and Strong, it says this. He says, Baal Gad is not unfavorable to the conclusion which some have reached that it is no other than the place which from a temple consecrated to the sun that stood there was by the Greeks called Heliopolis, a city of the sun, and which the natives call and still call Baalbek, a word apparently of the same meaning. And as this work states, for many years, Baalbek was known as Heliopolis, named after the city of the sun and the pagan worship center in Egypt. And it was also known in scripture as Baal Gad. So when we go to the word of God and we found out what the scripture says about Baal Gad, we're going to get a real historical his and spiritual picture of just what's going on here. Now, let's go to the scripture. And we're going to read in Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. And we remember when we read Baal Gad, we're talking about Baal Beck. So Joshua took all that land, the hills and all the south country, and all the lands of Goshen, and the valley and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same. Even from Mount Halak, that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad, there's our word, that's Baalbek, even unto Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them. Joshua made a long time, made war a long time with all those kings. And scripture tells us that there was a great slaughter here where Joshua put to death many of these pagan kings here at Baalbek. And in verse 14, this gives us the extremity of the situation. This was an absolute total smackdown. This was Nephilim extermination 101. This was the heart of the heart of the, of the deal here. In Joshua 11 and 14, and all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. If they breathed, they were dead. This was the highest infestation of Nephilim blood. This was ground zero. And people that do not understand the Genesis 6 narrative of the sons of God and the daughters of men, and we're speaking of that, which the Bible tells us in Genesis 6, that fallen angels inbred with human women and they produced these giants they were called the mighty men of old the gibberim the nephilim the rephaim and there's just so much in the word of god about giants and when you go to secular history they just don't exist this is just put into fairy tale land and to even begin to have serious consideration by secular historians that Baalbek might have been built by giants is just not going to happen now, in Joshua 13 and 1, it says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. And in the, in the next verse here, in verse 5, this shows us that the land that we are talking about that runs from Damascus down southwest 35 miles, we're going to show you these valleys. And they go from there down to Baalbek. It says, And the land of the Giblites and all Lebanon toward the sun rising from Baal Ged, that's Baalbek, under Mount Hermon, unto the entering into Hamath. And this area was never taken. Joshua had a great slaughter here. He slaughtered many kings, but this land was never possessed. And this continued to be a great stumbling block unto Israel. And uh, it, it caused them, we're, we're going to see the tremendous damage it done because they did not go in and possess that. Now again, from McClintock and Strong, it says here on page 584, it says the modern representative of Baal Gad is Benias a place which long maintained a great reputation 
as a sanctuary of Pan, see Carceria Philippi. And this is the place in Scripture where Jesus said this very thing. Now we're talking about at the very bottom, at, at, at Mount Hermon, on top of it where the fallen angels come down, you can see the lights of Damascus from the top of Mount Hermon. 35 miles to the southwest, we have Baalbek. Right at the bottom of Mount Hermon, on the left side, the tribe of Dan had their, their inheritance. They, you can read in the Bible, they went totally full-blown into idolatry. And many of the early fathers believed that the beast of Revelation 13 would come from the tribe of Dan. And there's something to be said for that. Down to the center and to the right, was the inheritance of Manasseh. And Manasseh, Ephraim shared with Manasseh in the early part of the conquest until they got their own allotment farther to the south. But right here at the base of Mount Hermon, as this valley goes down into Baalbek, this area that was never taken, Jesus said these words, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we're going to show you here a picture of the very spot where Jesus said this. And this word, Banias, it was a word that was synonymous with Baalbek. And this is the very place to this day uh, where this cave is that they still claim is the gate to hell. And I would not argue with them because this place, it is evil. This is uh, portal number one. There's a lot of portals, but this would be portal number one on, uh, on earth right here, the actual cave of Pan. Interesting, man. I know you're going to get into Pan, but what a, you know, it's, it, it's amazing when you really look at Pan, how, how much it affects the whole world we live in, that, just that word. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the old Baphomet goat, of course, is a prototype of the god Pan. Now, this is also interesting. This is a drawing of another temple that they had at Baalbek, and they called it the Temple of the Dancing Goats. Now, there was a relationship, and of course, Egypt looms large in the transmission of the mystery religions and idolatry, and Heliopolis, the worship center with all of the obelisk in Egypt, Baalbek was called Heliopolis also, and both mean uh, the city of the sun, where the sun and the heavenly luminaries were worshipped. Here in Baalbek, they had a temple to Venus, a temple to Jupiter, and also they had this temple of the dancing goats. Now, isn't that nice? And of course, in Freemasonry and also in the Odd Fellows, they talk about riding that goat. And the goat of Mendez is from Mendez, Egypt. And, and there, the goats did more than dance. I'll just leave it at that. But there were open public rites of bestiality that were carried on there at Mendez, Egypt. And the goat of Mendez, of course, this was drawn as the Baphomet by free Mason Eliphas Levi, and this is to this day the high icon of, of Satanism and the occult. Now, this is a book, and we've already mentioned the six-pointed star, which Masonic authorities have confirmed that this is something that is very Masonic, and you see, it's not that, and well, Freemasonry, they claim their first Grand Master was Nimrod, but we're seeing that in the Indiana Monitor, it speaks of Freemasonry as a reservoir into which occult lore from many eons have poured its resources. And that's what it is. Freemasonry is a hodgepodge of Luciferian paganism from the Egyptian and Babylonian mysteries, and it is nothing but an absolute occult mess. But in this teaching, Mr. Hall makes this statement. He says, Great Pan did not die. Freemasonry is the proof of his survival. And what else can you say? They are proud to be, and they claim to be the modern expressions of the pagan mysteries that have fought against the Israel of God even long before the time of Christ. 
They brag about Freemasonry being the perpetuating the worship of the god Pan, just like in this ancient temple here at Baalbek. Now, this is the picture that is reproduced in the secret teachings of all ages, and this is the drawing of Pan. Now, where Mr. Hall got this from was from the Jesuit scholar Athanathius Kircher. And I found out when I started reading Athanathius Kircher just how much Manly P. Hall drew from Kircher when he wrote and drew his titles. But I mean, look at this. I mean, this is just disgusting. And this is the great god Pan who Freemasonry is so proud to perpetuate its survival. And the worship of these ancient creatures, and of course this is also uh, the satire, it goes back to the fallen ones of the inbreeding of the half-human, half goat half satires that we read about in Freemasonry. I mean, and there's just, uh, you know, what can you say about it? They own it. You know, they don't run from it. They own it. And look at, like, look at that shepherd staff, too. You know, that's interesting to me. You know, it talks about the idle shepherd. It talks about the evil shepherd in the Bible and his right eye being darkened. But it, that staff tells me a lot you know this is this is literally the shepherd of the evil you know yeah you uh, know yeah. all, all the movies that you see pan in all the children's movies and um, all of that it just makes you wonder what are they what are they getting at here and the pan flute you know yeah. the god pan would play his flute and the children would follow along yeah. peter pan all of it and the defilement of children is so much connected with this we're going to also before we're done we're going to connect these series of valleys with the Valley of Gehenna, where the little children were sacrificed to Moloch. And um, it is just an, it's an ugly, ugly picture. And understanding the geography here, it's going to help us understand a lot of things. Now, Strong and McClintock also have this to say about Baalbek. It says the largest stones... Okay, let me see. Get my right page here. 583. All right. It says, they are, says Richter, the largest stones I have ever seen and might of themselves have easily been given rise to the popular opinion that Baalbek was built by angels at the command of Solomon. Now, this is also one of the most ancient occult traditions that the stones that you looked at there were built by Solomon with magic control of angels. Now, myself, I believe it's older. I think it goes back, but I think that that has a lot to do with it. And we're going to show that this is the very place where Solomon built his house, where he went totally south. I mean, he went totally south. Just a reminder for those listening that that stone that we're talking about here, the heaviest stone they've ever listed is 20 tons, 20.133 tons. This bellback stone is 1,200 tons. So we're talking, you know, a, a almost 800, whatever, a thousand pounds or a thousand tons more. Yeah. So you know, this is a this is a big uh, big difference. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Huge. Now. There's a writing here that I'm going to refer to and read a little bit from. Uh, this is reproduced in the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha by James Charlesworth, and it's called the Testament of Solomon. Now, the Testament of Solomon is a spiritually toxic book. It is a dark text, and we're reading it for the purpose of confirming the demonic influence that comes from this very place. And in the Testament of Solomon, Solomon with a seal and a ring controls demons. And he controls these demons to do building projects for him. And this is the very thing that was referred to in Strong and McClintock of this ancient legend that Solomon, through controlling devils, and uh, all kinds of occult beings built these stones. Now, in this book, The Testament of Solomon, it talks about Solomon controlling a winged dragon. It talks about Solomon controlling a three-headed dragon spirit. Uh, it talks about all kinds of 
the whole Genesis 6 scenario of these dragons uh, cohabitating with human women, and just a little bit of it in uh, chapter 2. When I heard these things, I, Solomon, got up from my throne and saw the demon shuddering and trembling with fear. I said to him, Who are you? What is your name? The demon replied, I am Ornias. And it goes on, and Solomon would one by one ask the devils, Well, what angel thwarts you? And then he would thwart the demon and have them go to work for him. Now, it says here, After I sealed the demon with my seal, I ordered him to the stone quarry to cut for the temple stones which had been transported by way of the Arabian Sea and dumped along the seashore. Now, here we go again. The seal of Solomon is the six-pointed star, and the seal of Solomon is one of the most powerful black magic sigils, and this seal was on the Temple of Jupiter right there in Baalbek. And according to this ancient text, and according to confirm the ancient legend, that Solomon built these building projects with the help of devils. Now, I will say this, the temple was built and ordained by God. That was something that God ordained to build the temple. But we're going to see here as we get into the scripture that there was some things that went wrong between the building of the temple and when Solomon built his house here. And we're going to see here, and I'll confirm it here with a text here from McClintock. And it says here, I'm looking for... Number three here. I've got so many references here from this book. I've just got to zero in on it here. All right. Um, John, go ahead and say something. Give me just a minute to run this <laughs> down. Right. Help me out well, here. Say goodness, something. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess going back to the Seal of Solomon, since that was the last thing you talked about here, um, it's an interesting concept, and I and I believe I really do believe that he did have the ability to control demons. I really do believe that. I, I think that this part of the wisdom that he was granted was perhaps the secret name, right? The name that nobody knew until until he came to be able to do this and then he had the seal you know seals these six pointed stars have been used throughout witchcraft and kabbalah and every ancient dark magic to uh used as a seal to, for protection from demonic entities yeah. and a seal also to um in enclose them into this spot so when they would call forth entities they would be sealed inside yeah. of the seal and what we could call this are devil magnets these are black magic talismans, and people want to put the Star of David on their Bibles. They want to wear Star of David necklaces. Uh, they think it's great. It's cool. It's not cool. Yeah. There's nothing cool about it. It is not cool. It is not of God. Now, here, under the article of Baalbek in Strong and McClintock, it says this, and this will enable us to open up a whole other area of research. It says, Baalbek a city of Kole, Syria, and supposed by many to be the site designated by Solomon's famous House of the Forest of Lebanon, 1 Kings 7, 1 Kings 10, 2 Chronicles 9. Now, Solomon built his house at Baalbek, and we've got a lot of information on that, and you might ask, well, why did he do that? And there was an attraction for some reason of Solomon to this area. And the, to this day, the seal of Solomon and the black magic uh, uh, grimoires that bear the name of Solomon, they are the most powerful black magic grimoires in existence. Now, let's read some scripture. Now understanding that Solomon's house was built here at Baalbek. 1 Kings 7 and 1. But Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished all his house. Now, if you just back up to 1 Kings chapter 6, it gives the record of Solomon building the temple. 
He spent seven years building the temple. Seven is God's perfect number, and he took almost twice as long, 13 years, to build his own house here at Baalbek. That tells us something, doesn't it? In verse 8, and it says, In his house where he dwelt and had another court within the porch, which was like of the like work, Solomon made also an house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken to wife, like unto this porch. Now, it was absolutely forbidden in the Torah to marry pagan women. And he married Pharaoh's daughter. And, of course, we know that Solomon's sexual fallings was the thing that led him to rank idolatry. It was just terrible. You can see some of the maps of Jerusalem. And when you look at the Temple Mount, there on the east side of the Temple Mount, in many of your maps, it'll say the Mount of Corruption. Mm -hmm. And Solomon had many pagan wives, and it was the custom of these pagan wives, the firstborn child would be sacrificed. Yeah. And that was the place where Solomon went that far. I mean, we're talking about not just going a little bit bad. He went bad to the bone. Yeah. An interesting fact about the women and stuff in that area, the Lebanese women are known as the most beautiful women in the world. They're voted the top most beautiful women in the world, which, you know, this would explain maybe why the fallen angels were attracted to that area, what maybe why Solomon is attracted to that area, because maybe these women have something uh, more beautiful about them that, than the rest of the world. I mean, this is just according to what I'm reading right now. The Lebanese yeah. women are the most beautiful in the world. And they do look beautiful. There's no doubt they about are. it. Yeah, so... And the Song of Solomon, which I didn't go into this aspect, but in the Song of Solomon, we also have references to Baalbek. And that's another whole level. We didn't even go into that in this presentation. But, you know, that's absolutely, absolutely a fact. Now, also in this area, we see multiple connections with Freemasonry. In 1 Kings 7, 13, and 14, And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was a widow's son, you know. Is there no help for the widow's son? Mm -hmm. And, of course, in Freemasonry in the third degree, Hiram of Biff is the hero of the third degree of Freemasonry. And he is the worker on the temple, and he is slain while he is working on uh, Solomon's temple here in the Masonic legend. And then he is killed, and then the worshipful master, he raises him from the dead with the strong grip of the lion's paw, and every Freemason plays the part of Hiram Abiff. And Hiram Abiff is a composite character of two Hirams in the Bible. We're going to show them to you. And when the Freemason plays the part of Hiram Abiff, he is raised from the dead. And when he is raised from the dead, symbolically, by the strong grip of the lion's paw, by the master of the lodge, he whispers the secret word, into the master mason's ear and that word is so secret we can't even tell you mm -hmm. oh heck i'll tell you it's maha bone and uh that is the secret word that when masons know you know maha bone they go it's like throwing water on the witch in the wizard of oz ah! <laughs> but you know this is another one of the big lies about freemasonry that what they do is secret it is not we know what you do when you crawl around on your knees in the dark in the lodge hall you need to repent be ashamed of yourself it goes on to say he was a widow son of the tribe of Natali, and his father was a man of tire a worker in brass and he was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work all works in brass and he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. In 2 Samuel 5 and 11, here is the other Hiram. That is, the Hiram of Biff is fictional, but it's made up of a composite of these two Hirams. In 2 Samuel 5 and 11, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David and house. And this led to an ungodly alliance between the Tyre, which was in Lebanon, Tyre and Siren is Lebanon, where Baalbach is also. And because of all of the money and all of the trees and all of the labor that Hiram, king of Tyre, gave into the temple, 
We'll read what it says. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, which was in Baalbek. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Another outright violation of Torah to give the inherited land of Israel unto a pagan king. But at this point, obeying Torah was not on uh, Solomon's radar screen. He had gone bad and he was trampling on the word of God left and right. He had gone full blown into the dark side. Now, when anyone sees a clue here, just wave at me. First Kings 10, 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon one year was 603 score and six talents of gold, 660. Six. So it's just the picture the Word of God paints for us here is the sad picture of a man of God gone totally bad. And some scholars believe that in his old age Solomon came back to God and that he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he was an old man. I hope that's true, but it can't be proven. I really hope Solomon came back to the Lord. But there's really no biblical proof of that. We can just hope that's the case. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. This is his house at Baalbek. Now, any way you want to slice it, that is a whole bunch of gold. That is just an amazing amount of gold that Solomon heaped into this place. I mean, it's just, uh, it speaks for itself. Now, this is even, this is even gets wilder. It, you know, like say there's more, it gets worse. In 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 18 through 20, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory, and overlaid it with the best gold. Now this is in the house at Baalbek. This is not in the temple. This is the Baalbek house. And the throne had six steps. Well, of course it had six steps. And the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side of the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays. And 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other, and with the, the 12 lions plus him, there we got the number 13. There's all kinds of numbers here that are, are so meaningful all throughout this story. And 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other, and upon the six steps there was not the like made in any kingdom. Now, we're going to look at the Septuagint here. And the Septuagint, which was an ancient a translation of the scriptures from Hebrew into Greek. Now, the Septuagint has a lot of problems with it, and I only use the Septuagint as a commentary. And many people, well, not many, but there's some that will want to argue that the Septuagint is the real authority. And that's really ridiculous because the Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew, and they want to make the translation more authoritative than what it was translated from. And that just is a little bit nonsensical. But because of its great age, it's interesting as a commentary. And you'll see what I mean right here. It says, and this is the Septuagint reading of 1 Kings 10, 19, talking about Solomon's throne. The throne had six steps and calves in bold relief to the throne behind it and side pieces on either hand of the place of the seat, and two lions standing by the side pieces. Now, according to the Septuagint, there were calves behind this throne. Now, why is that important? And we've talked in a lot of midnight rides. We talked all the way back to the battle of the, of the kings that Abraham and Melchizedek were involved with. There was Ashtoreth Carnahim. Ashtoreth of the two horns. And we've talked about how the two horns that we see all through paganism, whether on the Viking's helmet, 
that this came from the way that Venus will travel in the sky. It's sometimes a morning star, sometimes an evening star, and literally in its course through the sky, it would be like a helmet with two horns. And Lucifer was worshipped as the planet Venus. And we see, and, and it was the calf, the calf horns. Mithras was worshipped as a calf. The golden calf, with, uh, when the law was given. We have the golden calves of Jeroboam in Israel that were set up. And uh, this is huge. And right here we see it, and I would tend to believe that, that uh, Solomon had gone that far, that there were calves behind the throne, because at this point, the God that Solomon was worshiping was not the true God of Israel. He went full-blown into the calf worship of paganism. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 10, for the king had a sea, had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Now, if it took them three years to make a trip and come back, I wonder where they were going. Now, this is what I believe, and I can't prove it, but I could go into a lot of things that could really buttress us, and in my mind, I can prove it, and in the mind of many other people, that I believe at this time Solomon was already coming over here to America. And there's even evidence, and, uh, and many people believe, that Solomon's copper mines were around Lake Superior, in, uh, up in the Great Lakes, and also in the eastern part of Kentucky. Now, I think this is something that's very, very probable. It says in verse 23, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom, and all the earth sought to Solomon. Now, maybe that means that all the earth really sought to Solomon, and on these three-year journeys where Solomon was going and bringing back riches, I believe that they came to the Americas. And there are we could talk about Hebrew letters being found here. We could talk also about uh, Canaanite writing up in the northeastern part of the United States. And I believe it took place at other times, but I believe it took place right here. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence of Hebrews here long before we were here, long before the Native Americans may have been here. Maybe some of the Native Americans are Hebrews, but you also have uh, this the idolatry this you know just the idolatry version we have antediluvian temples here so like the idea that solomon wouldn't have came here or couldn't have come here would be to me be outraged it would if he's the wisest man on earth that would mean he would know about one of the richest most beautiful places in the world right this huge continent yeah. we call america right yeah so. and i believe that those huge stones were there before solomon but i believe solomon learned the secret yeah. of how to do it. I, I think too. Solomon was full-blown, tapped into fallen angel yeah. knowledge. I think he was hooked up, and I think that his great wisdom yes. and his great power, he totally gave over to Satan. Yeah. And such a sad, sad commentary on that. Somebody says apes and ivory sounds like Africa. I'm sure they collected things from all over the world. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Yeah, yeah. that would indicate ivory. And, and this was cyclical. Every three years, they would go out, a fleet three years that come back and that'd be plenty of time to go anywhere you want yeah. and uh and the bible says all the earth sought solomon and i think you know i i just have a tendency to believe what the bible says yeah. and when we take that literally there's a lot of things we can see to buttress this idea that indeed uh it was all the way to america that uh, solomon did come right here at this time yeah now I want to look at another thing here from McClintock and Strong. And it says here, Baal Gad will mean Baal's crowd. According to this view, Baal Gad would mean the place of God, Gad. Now, Gad was an idol, Isaiah 65:11, supposed to have been the god or goddess of good fortune and identified by the Jewish commentators with the planet Jupiter. And we've seen that there was at this site 
a temple Jupiter built and also a temple to Venus built right there at Baalbek. And this is borne out by the meaning of this name. And once again, we're going to go to the Septuagint and we're going to see that the Septuagint understands this. And I bet that the people that translated the Septuagint, uh, it was done in Egypt and Baalbek was called Heliopolis after the great Egyptian temple that they were pretty hip on what was going on here. But anyway, it says here, but ye are they that have left me and forget my holy mountain and prepare a table for the devil and fill up the drink offering to fortune. And this is literally speaking of the worship of this devil and of the false communion rituals and all the licentious rites that was taking place right here at Baalbek. Now, once again here from McClintock and Strong, we're going to read something that is going to enable us to trace it even farther. And the picture we have that at the bottom of Mount Hermon, we have the cave of Pan where Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. And you see, the gates of hell prevailed against Joshua. From, from the cave of Pan where Jesus said that, down to Baalbek, that was never taken. Joshua did a great slaughter there at Baalbek of these pagan kings, but they didn't possess it. And Jesus saying has double meaning that the gates of hell will not possess. Yeah, they didn't possess it then. Yeah, Israel's backslid now. But the Israel of God will not be prevailed upon by these devils that come place, come forth from this area. Now, the article in uh, McClintock and Strong, The Valley of Baca, and it says, on the name of the trees, it comes from the name of the trees, Bacame, the mulberry, from which the valley probably derived its name. Some regard this as a valley, Baca, or plain in which Baalbek is situated. The rendering is the Gihenam, or ravine below Mount Zion. So basically what we're talking about, at the base of Mount Hermon where Jesus said the gates of hell will, that will not prevail, there are valleys that run to the southwest to Lebanon and then valleys that go to Jerusalem. And we're going to see how these valleys connect and we're going to see the scripture that talks about the pilgrims when they would go to worship at the feast they would have to walk through these areas. And that had to be a little spooky. And here's one of them here in Psalm 84, verse 6 and 7. Who passing through the valley of Baca, this is that valley where Baalbek is, make it a well, the rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. And it speaks of the pilgrims as they come to worship at Jerusalem in the feast, that they travel through this valley. And we're going to see here again, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and we'll get the identification of Baca. And we see here that there's a valley in verse 22. It's connected with the valley of Gihanam. It's connected with in 2 Samuel 5:22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And like McClintock and Strong said, this was the valley of Baca where Baalbach went, Baalbach was, and as it goes toward Jerusalem, it connects into what was called the Valley of the Rephaim, then the Valley of Gihenam, where they sacrificed the little children unto Moloch and burnt them alive. And it is just amazing. It says here in verse 23, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees, and let it be, when thou hearest the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself 
for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And in this valley there was a great victory given unto David because he obeyed the Lord and, uh, and moved and brought a tremendous victory against the Philistines in this very valley. Now, as I said earlier, when you look at the way the tribes inherited the land, to the bottom left, we have the tribe of Dan, and in the center, we have Manasseh. And before they got their own allotment, Ephraim and Manasseh both were there right at the foot of Mount Hermon. And Ephraim also was infested with the worship of the calf, and they went totally bad. In Hosea chapter 4, 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. And it was from this area, and it was from the tribe of Ephraim that the calf worship uh, became prominent in Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 26, And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zareda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted his hand up against the king. And it was Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that established the worship of the calf in Samaria and in Dan. And this was the, the mainstream of idolatry that led to the total apostasy of Israel. And its spiritual root was all in this area that was never taken. You see, and when this is a spiritual lesson for us, you see, when you cleanse yourself of idols, you don't want to stop without taking that six-pointed star off your, off your jewelry, off of your Bible. You don't want nothing to do with this. I guarantee you, this is toxic. This is not some game to play. Uh, this is ground zero for evil 101. And ignorance is an excuse. The verse you had before on Hosea, it was a mistake when we had it. We changed it. It was Hosea 4, 6. It talks about the people being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's exactly what this stuff does to people because yeah. almost always, even in the Bible, the people were ignorant and they didn't even know God's name sometimes. They were worshiping these things as if they were God and had yeah. really no idea. And now we hear 2022 here in 2022 and we're seeing the same exact thing people have no idea what they're doing no not even caring actually no they don't care yeah and you've been told everybody that's listened to this broadcast you've been told what it is yeah. and if you persist in doing it it's on you yeah. you know go ahead uh make star david cookies and eat them you yeah. know put them all over your little self <laughs> it's not of god it ain't right and you're going to pay a spiritual price for it there's no doubt about it um in Isaiah, now I want us to also, I want us to get the connection. There's so many other things. Ezekiel 31 talks about the Assyrian be a cedar in Lebanon. And here again, this goes back even to the Garden of Eden, where we see these ancient primordial uh, fallen sephirim. And it says also, there's scripture that says that the Assyrian built the kingdom of Babylon. So this is ground zero stuff here. This is ground zero of the total uh, progression of the kingdom of Satan with its war on the Israel of God. Now, note here, this is a scripture we've read, and this thing's going to blow up right here. In Isaiah 17, 1 through 3, and we've talked about this a lot, the burden of Damascus. Now, we're 35, 5 miles from Baalbek at Damascus, you can see the lights of Damascus from the top of Mount Hermon where the fallen ones come down. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. Google Earth, it's still there. Don't tell me this is fulfilled. And it shall be a ruinous heap. And the, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress shall also cease from Ephraim. There's going to be a big blowback here. And Ephraim and Israel is heavily fortified there in the north on that border with Syria. And this was where Ephraim fell into calf worship at the very foot of Mount Hermon in this area from 
Mount Hermon to ball back in this area that was never taken. Well, the father's going to take it. He's going to set it on fire. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And read the rest of Isaiah 17. It goes on to describe Israel after this as being just like when you pick olives. And when you pick olives and you shake the tree and there's just a few left in the top of the tree you don't get. This is the picture that is given in Isaiah 17 of Israel. What we're seeing here is a big war. And this will be the big war that will kick off the last half of the Daniel 70th week. We've synchronized this with Daniel 11, with the book of 2nd Estrus, and with the book of Enoch. We've talked a lot about this. And it's so, the, the more you talk about it, the more it makes sense. And there's another scripture here in Zechariah 11 and 1 that speaks of this fire that's going to go out. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy theaters. This speaks of the same time frame as Isaiah 17 and 1, when God is going to judge this area. This area was never taken by Joshua, but right here the Father's going to take it back. He's going to burn it to a crisp, and the end time time clock of the last half of Daniel's 70th week is going to be set in motion right here. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour thy cedars. It's going to get real hot for those UN boys up on top of Mount Hermon. Man, and you know, it's so interesting. I remember when the speech was made, I believe by, I believe it was made by Obama, if I remember correctly. After 9-11, they planted a cedar tree there where the tower stood. And then he gave the quote about Lebanon and the cedar trees from yeah. the Bible. Oh, and yeah. He's basically pronouncing judgment on the United oh, States. Oh, yeah. That was pretty interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Very, Man. very interesting. The United States tie to Lebanon and to all of that is interesting as well. It you is know. hugely interesting. Yeah. What an awesome show, David. This has really been good. Um, you know, this uh, every time we uncover more things and, and get closer and closer and closer to finding out just so much more every little every show we do i feel like we're finding out more steps just closer and closer to painting this massive picture that um is hard to paint by just looking at regular history you almost have to you have to take a deep dive into almost every little aspect of this to really understand it all and we're trying to do that it's really cool and and the more we study the more we pray and the more we look to the word of god for answers the more dots connect yeah. and the more everything makes sense Amen to that. So thank you guys so much for listening. We 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 greatly appreciate all of you who support what we do. Uh, without you guys, we could not do this. And um, it doesn't it. We don't think of it lightly. Let's put it that way. We are we are just super grateful to be able to reach this many people with biblical things is uh, a feat that could have only happened for us in in this time in twenty you know in this this century. Um, because of internet, because of all of this, but literally thousands of people, baseball stadiums full of people are listening to this program right now. And we're grateful, man. We, we couldn't be more humbled because we, we definitely don't deserve any glory or honor for this at all. But the fact that there are people that are out there that want to, want to hear this and really care about the truth of the word is just mind blowing to me. And I love it. I'm, I'm just so thankful. Uh, with that being said, David, uh, you got anything else to say? And if, and if not, let's do the Pounder's Pound. Let's do. Okay, the Pounder's Pound is where we all pound the like button at the same exact time to create this huge, just massive explosion of likes um, on this video. So if you guys would do it with us, David, count us down. And like John said, if you are appreciated this teaching tonight and uh, – Want to hit that like button? We invite you to join us now on the Pounder's Pound. One, two, two three, three, boom. Boom. Uh, it, it, it halfway exploded, David. didn't do it all the way. we got to do it one more time. All right. I'm seeing like, oh, there it went. All right. They hit it. They hit it. That took a second, man. That was that was good, though. Thank you guys so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, man, we, we are totally appreciative of this. And, and if you guys haven't subscribed yet, make sure to do it. Uh, we also have a list of other channels that we have uh, where we also produce content that's important, right? It's not all, not every show we do is just like the Midnight Ride. 
but all of the shows we do, we all we feel that all of them have a real valid importance to the walk of people and and to their lives, and so that how they they can walk according to God's the doctrine of Jesus, and also walk according to wisdom, which is something that the world seems to have missed, uh, especially in this day and age. So thank you guys so much, David, if you're ready to end this out. We thank the Lord every time we get to do a broadcast and we get to share the gospel. And it's just our heart's cry that if any of you don't know Jesus, you turn to him now with all your heart. Place your faith in his death upon the cross as payment for your sin debt. Repent of your sin and turn to Jesus. He's the only answer that we have. And with that, we just want to say, until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.